All right, we are on our fifth video. Fifth video, it should be a little shorter than the fourth. Sorry, the fourth was a little long. The fifth, I'm gonna focus on cycles, biogeochemical cycles. Before I start though, there were two pictures that I found that I really wanted to show you. Um, relating back to some things we've already done, nitrogen and phosphorus, two elements that are super, super imp important for soil composition and for plants to really thrive. We want them to be the bottom of that biomass pyramid, be great in number, be great in efficiency of photosynthesis. We find that plants are most successful, the greatest biomass, so when you dry it out, the greatest biomass of plants comes when there is a great deal of nitrogen and phosphorus in the soil. So fertilizers, what do they have? Nitrogen and phosphorus. If you only have one or the other, you tend to have a lot less plant growth. It's not as effective at growing. So when farmers want to boost their crops, they fertilize. They add, um, they add manure to a field because it's high in nitrogen. It's got a lot of chemicals that it's adding to the soil, nitrogen and phosphorus, so that the plants will be more successful at growth. The other thing I wanted to show you, and it relates back, I just thought it was a great picture, I want you to always notice the conservation of energy when you're looking at either trophic level distribution or um, simply what is one organism using its energy for. So it had 200 joules of energy that it ate. Some of those joules of energy went to waste, half of it went to waste. Some of it went to growth, meaning when an organism eats this, it can use some of that energy. And a lot of it went to um, that organism's respiration, meaning what did this organism have to do in its mitochondria to break down the sugars it was eating so that it could move and chew and um, do all of the life processes that it needs to stay alive. So if you take the number 200, it should equal out to these three, and it does. There's actually a lot of easy math problems on the AP where they'll take out one of these numbers and you just have to calculate, well, if I had 200 and I've used 100 and I've used 67, what's left? 33. So it's really easy math. I just want to make sure it came up at some point. All right, in your notes, we're on C. So we've done A, we've done B. We're now going to focus today just on these biogeochemical cycles. Some of them I'm going to assume you already know. The first one we're going to do, well, actually, let me just take a second. In an ecosystem, you're always talking about transforming energy and processing matter. And that's what every living thing is doing, transforming energy because it eats food and then it uses it in some way. And processing matter, that's the food that we're eating and what do we do with it? So we need to capture energy, transfer energy, cycle nutrients. Every organism needs to do this. If you're an autotroph, you're able to capture sun's energy. If you're a heterotroph like us, you need to capture food and eat it. We all transfer energy, which means we use it in different ways. We use it for energy to do all of these processes that we do every single day. And we cycle nutrients. So every time you eat something with nitrogen, your body needs to figure out what it's going to do with it, that nitrogen. Is it going to use it to build muscle? Is it part of your urine that gets released out of your body? What happens to it? Everything gets cycled in some way. So today's focus is on these cycles. Energy is coming from the sun. It's going through these nutrient cycles, and we got to remember matter can't be created or destroyed, so we have to have some way, and I hope you're thinking decomposers, some way that helps us recycle everything. All right, if we look at the nutrients available to producers, producers use that energy, consumers eat it, everything ends up going back to a decomposer. Decomposers allow abiotic reservoirs to come back to the producers. Now, sometimes we have um, bacteria, obviously bacteria is a decomposer, that actually uses nutrients in the air and in the soil so that they can be absorbed up by plants and brought through the cycle again. Geological processes like the weathering of rocks can also add to an increase in the number of, for example, phosphates from rocks into the water or into the soil so that plants can take it up. All right, let's go through these cycles. These are all in your textbook. Same diagram in your textbook. I'm just going to explain it through. In your textbook, it talks about what's the reservoir. Reservoir means where do you find it most abundant? Where is it most of the time? Assimilation, to assimilate means to go into and become a part of something. So assimilation means how does it get from one type of organism to another type of organism or one trophic level to another trophic level. And then um, maybe recyclers. I can't think of what the last one is in your book, but it goes through some, um, some 
explanation for each one of these. So you use the same picture, look through the examples they gave you or the explanation they gave you. I'm going to give you my spoken word of explanation. So water cycle, I don't even want to spend five seconds on this. You've got water in the air, you've got precipitation, that's how it adds to the ground. It's either going to be added to lakes, added to oceans, added to some sort of water pond area, or it goes into the soil and becomes part of runoff going into a body of water or down to the water table. And then we have evaporation occurring from bodies of water. We also have animals and plants that are constantly using water. We drink water, we release water, we sweat, we urinate. So we always have water coming out from us and that's why we have to constantly keep hydrated. Now plants, I put a little picture here. I really, really hope that you remember transpiration where water gets pulled up a tree. So this arrow, I don't know why that arrow is going that direction, but I need an arrow going up. I need water to go from the soil into the roots, up through the xylem, that part of a plant that transports water, through the xylem into a leaf and out stomates, the openings in the leaf. And the amount of transpiration that occurs is usually dependent on what's the temperature, what is the water potential outside the plant, meaning how much water is necessary. If you're in a humid area, it's very low water potential and it won't lose a lot of water. If it's a very dry place, like a desert, you're going to have a lot of transpiration because there's a high water potential, a high need for water outside of the plant. So movement of water up through, um, very, very important. All right, let's move on to another cycle. Again, carbon cycle, I don't want to spend a lot of time. If you have questions, I can certainly go over it. But water cycle and carbon cycle, I'm assuming you've learned lots of times. We have a lot of carbon in us. You are, the majority of you is water, and then the next majority of you is carbon. So carbon is in every organic matter, carbohydrates, proteins, fats, nucleic acids, all carbon components. So when you eat, you're eating carbon. When you um, are using energy, respiration, you're breaking down carbons and you're breathing out <sighs> carbon dioxide. So we are constantly adding to the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Any burning, any factories, anything that's, that's doing essentially respiration is going to increase the amount of CO2 in the air. Now plants, they're the one thing that are able to use the CO2 and they convert it into the carbs that we eat. And those carbs can be changed into proteins and those proteins contain the carbon. So um, here we have photosynthesis going on to lock in the carbon dioxide and then plants eating it and adding to the respiration. Plants also do respiration, so every living thing is going to add to the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. When something decomposes, they take the carbon components. So if you think about it, your muscle, your skin, all of this is carbon components. When you die, it can actually be broken down by detrivores or decomposers and cycle that carbon as carbon dioxide back into, we would call this our reservoir. All right. This one I'm going to spend a lot more time. I know you've learned it before, but it's probably something that you need a good refresher on. So, the most abundant nitrogens in the air. They say the air we breathe in is probably 78% nitrogen. Now, nitrogen looks like this. An N and an N, if you remember back to chemistry, triple bond. We can't break that triple bond. You breathe in nitrogen, you breathe out nitrogen. You didn't do anything to it. Does your body need nitrogen? Absolutely, but you can't use the gaseous form. So, we, we rely on organisms that are in the soil called nitrogen-fixing soil bacteria. These nitrogen-fixing bacteria take nitrogen and break that triple bond and produce NH3 or NH4. That's ammonia. NH3, NH4, both of them are ammonia. They are both a form of ammonia in the soil. Now, when something is decomposed, that also increases the amount of ammonia in the soil. So ammonia is a usable form of nitrogen in the soil. How is it used? Another type of bacteria, nitrifying bacteria, is going to convert this nitrogen. That's like we don't really, we don't ever take in ammonia. That would be toxic to us. We need to take in something that is much more useful. We need to take in protein. So to get to the level where we're at a protein, these nitrifying bacteria convert ammonia into nitrites or nitrates. If it's NO2, it's a nitrite. If it's an NO3, it's a nitrate. The big deal is it's got oxygen with the nitrogen and plants absorb nitrites and nitrates from the soil. So we rely on these two forms of bacteria 
first to change it from a gas into ammonia, that's nitrogen fixing. They are fixing the nitrogen from the air. And then nitrifying converts the ammonia into something usable that a plant could absorb. So a nitrate or a nitrate gets assimilated by a plant, meaning it's going to absorb it and then use it. And when it uses it, it converts nitrates into proteins. The proteins that are in a plant are the things that we eat. So when we eat a plant, usually you're eating a lot of, if you're eating a vegetable, chances are you're eating a lot of carbs, but there are some plants that produce high protein things like nuts. So legumes have a great deal of these nitrogen fixing and nitrifying bacteria that actually live on their roots. And um, hopefully you were able to see, I had a video up um, on my links, on my website, under resources, under videos, there was one on mycorrhizae. Mycorrhizae are a type of fungus that actually increases the surface area of a root and they allow more nitrogens to be absorbed up by it and therefore have a way more productive plant. So this plant now absorbs nitrates, produces proteins, Animals eat the proteins. Animals eat animals that have proteins. When you eat a hamburger, you're eating a whole bunch of protein. It's from the muscle of a cow. So you're taking that protein muscle and you're converting it in order to make your own more muscle or other things that you need proteins for. Proteins are very, very important in your body. They work as enzymes. They work as hormones, neurotransmitters, enzymes. There's so many jobs of a protein. So we need to have protein in our diet. So, once it's in the animal form, how can it get back? Because everything we got to talk about recycling. Every time you release ammonia, you're adding to the ammonia in the soil. And we don't release ammonia, we release urine, which is a form of urea, but it's going to come back to this same product due to bacteria. Also, when you die, same thing, any proteins in your body can be used by decomposers, convert it back into forms of ammonia. Now, I also have something to complete my circle. So to complete my circle, I've got to get this nitrogen gas back in the air or we would run out of nitrogen gas in the air. So denitrifying. If you think of the word nitrifying is meaning making the nitrogen usable, denitrifying makes the nitrogen unusable again. So denitrifying bacteria, also found in the soil, convert nitrates into um, atmospheric nitrogen again, and that completes our cycle. So look that over, add some information from your notes, ask me in class if you want me to draw it out again another way. All right, our last cycle of the day is the phosphorus cycle. So phosphorus is typically found as phosphates, which means phosphorus and oxygen together. Phosphorus is very um, abundant in rocks. Most rocks all have phosphorus within them, and as rocks weather, they add their phosphorus to where, wherever it's going, so usually into bodies of water. So these bodies of water, or the weathering of these rocks carrying through this runoff, add phosphates to water. Plants can absorb phosphates. PO4 is our most common. That You might remember that functional group from when we did... Um, not functional group, sorry. What do you call those? Table E from chemistry. Ah, polyatomic ions. That's a really important, a really abundant polyatomic ion. So PO4 with a negative three charge is phosphate. That's literally what this word means. Plants take it in, plants use it. You have phosphorus in all of your DNA. It's absolutely necessary for you to get phosphorus. How do you get it? Every time you eat a plant or an animal, you're getting its DNA. You're getting its phosphorus that it's using. So this cycle, we actually think is a pretty simple one because there's no um, air form of it. There's no gas form of phosphates. We're just looking at weathering, adding to phosphates in the soil, plants taking it up, and then decomposers breaking it back down into the soil. Um, I think that's where I have end. Yep, end of video. So hopefully that was a shorter one for you, and uh, ask me questions in class.